Welcome to our math and science show. I want to give a special welcome to those who are watching live. Hello to King Cat from New Jersey, Lily from Kansas, David and Adelaide from Illinois, Catherine from China, Pearson from Indiana, Monica from South Carolina, and so many more. I'm seeing the chat fill up. Hello to Yulia from California, Ivan from Italy, Queen Jane from Washington. Walker We're from Texas. Very happy to have you here with us this morning. And this morning we have a fantastic lesson all about rocks, fossils, and geological time. But before we get into that, I want to say welcome to you if you're watching the replay. We do have a specific format that we follow here. We're going to have a science lesson, then we have a little fact or fiction trivia segment, we have a math lesson, we have a riddle, and we have an art showcase at the end. But I do want to mention our art and engineering challenge at the beginning and at the end, just so that everyone has a chance to see those. So yesterday, our art prompt was to draw an undersea laboratory. If you were gonna have an undersea dwelling, what would it look like? And I'll share just a few at the beginning and then we'll see more at the end when we do our showcase. So we had some fantastic entries. Adelie drew this, this great collection of buildings that dolphins and humans are both living in. And I see that song, um, <laughs> <laughs> that song is, is everywhere. And then here we have an undersea lab with us doing science in the ocean, <laughs> which is quite awesome. And Sean did a great drawing of a building down on the ocean bottom. And then this one, Eli says, P.S. I agree with science mom in regards to the song. And in case you <laughs> haven't heard the song, it's become a little bit of a cult classic and I'm sure it will pop up at some point, but not yet, not <clears> yet. <throat> We also had a drawing with a scientist, painting with a scientist episode yesterday where we talked about the Cambrian forest, not Cambrian, <laughs> Carboniferous. A car we drew a Carboniferous forest. And on Mondays and Fridays, we have painting with a scientist. So we'll be back with another one on Friday. We're gonna tell the new prompts? <laughs> yes. Or, or is, that for, is that coming later? No, the, the new prompts for today, our engineering okay. challenge is to make a hexaflexagon. And we'll be showing you how to make one of those later on. And then it's a photo challenge instead of an art challenge. Mm -hmm. And the photo challenge is to make a forced perspective photo like this one. So you can see this little kid looks like he's about to get trapped underneath a giant glass, but really it's just a matter of perspective. The, the glass is close to the camera yeah. and he's farther away. And can you arrange things so that you make yourself or your favorite toy look like they shrunk, look like they went miniature. I, I've seen people do stuff like this with the leaning tower of pizza. They, they, they pose as though they're the ones holding it up. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. yes. So, okay. and, and you don't have to take it to make it look like you shrunk. You can do something like that where, you know, if you, there's like a leaning building, you can stand in front of it and make it look like you're holding it up. Or you can have someone else hold an object and make it look like you're holding it when really you're just standing way far back behind it. Um, have yeah. fun with it. I will say that for our art showcase, so you can post pictures of yourself online and tag us and we would love to see them. But for our art showcase, we'll only be pulling pictures that are of toys or other objects, not of any any people where we can actually see your faces. So if you want to have yourself featured, use a toy or creatively hide your face somehow so that then, then we can use you in our show. So, sounds right. fun. Now, but before we get into I'm so excited. science lesson, we're actually gonna play a little game t today. And the way this game works is I'm gonna ask each of you to give us a positive whole number and whoever picks the smallest positive whole number that nobody else chooses will be the winner. So and for for example, let's say that Math Dad and I are the only two people playing and we have to pick a number between one and three, whoever picks the, well, we need just, three people. We just pick, pick a small, smallest positive whole number and I, I would pick one. And, and if she picks if I picked one. If I two, Oh, then I won. But if I pick no, no, no. one if as you, well, if, I lose. No, no. If you picked two, I win. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> because I picked the smaller number. Yeah, but with two people, it's just not much of a game. That, that's why we need to crowdsource this. But yeah, if, if you're the only person that picks one, you win. But if somebody else picks one, we move on to two and we check that. And if there's more than one person there, oh, we go to three. And okay, so I, I love that you guys are throwing numbers out in the chat. However, what we want to do here is actually give you, just click on show. I'll just say, I'm gonna copy this so I can paste it into <laughs> the chat. Oops, not wrong one. Okay, so I've, I've, I've got an address here, but I'm going to post this in the chat so you can actually click on it because there's no way you're going to 
record that successfully. And I'm going to ask uh, our Science Mom teams to repost that. All right, guys, you're spamming the chat. The, the comment just keeps disappearing. So, <laughs> so Science Mom, Liza and Krista and Emily, they'll have that link as well, and they can post it in the chat. And remember, put your number in there, not in the chat, because if it's in the chat, we can't gather it to data and re gather it together into some data. But if you put it into this link, then we can gather it together and we can look at the data. Right. G going into this next week, we want to be able to actually run some experiments, do some hypothesis testing. And we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to collect data from all of you during the show. And so that's a lot of fun. kind of a dry run. Well, we'll, we hope it works here. So I'm going to, to hide this. And yeah, you'll just want to use the link in the chat. and. Uh, please don't submit more than one number, although if there are multiple people in your family watching, each of you can submit the forms separately. So that being said, we might remind you of that, but I think we're ready for our Rocks. geology lesson. We'll, we'll come back to this game later. I'm so excited, you guys. I have a good friend who is probably watching in the chat. Shout out to Justin Costa Rica. He's a geologist, and he dropped off several amazing fossils and other rocks that we could use in our demonstration today. And so the first one I want to show you is a trilobite. <gasps> this is a trilobite fossil. Trilobites lived a long, long time ago. And the closest thing that we have today that looks kind of like a trilobite is a horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs are also very old, but trilobites are even older. Millions of years ago, these were the dominant species on Earth. There were large trilobites like this one. There were small, you know, little tiny trilobites, tons of different species in these shallow oceans that covered a large portion of our world, and they were the dominant life form. But now we only find them as fossils. Have you ever wondered how a fossil forms? How do we get this beautiful impression of a trilobite? Or how do we get um, rocks like this? where you can see impressions of shells. So thousands, not thousands, I can't believe I said that, millions, millions of years ago, this was mud on a, sal a shallow coastal water area, you know, shallow ocean area. This was mud and there were clams living in it. But then over millions of years, the minerals invaded this area that used to be a clam and they filled in the space in between the cells but they did it so slowly and in such a way that the clamshell turned into rock. It fossilized and became rock. The same thing happens with dinosaur bones. This is the claw of a T-Rex, a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And you can see it is enormous. All birds and reptiles, almost all birds and reptiles have this, this claw on their, their front digit, on their, on their fingers. And this claw is called the killer claw. It's very sharp, very large. And this is a mold made from a real life Tyrannosaurus rex fossil. Since it's a mold, it's not quite as heavy as a real fossil would be, but that's that's what these fossils look like. So that's the only one today that's not a real fossil. Yes, this is the only one that's not a real fossil. All the other fossils I'm showing you are real. This one is a, a cast. So they made a mold of a Tyrannosaurus fossil and then they made they filled it up in with you know this material and made several casts that you could buy. All right, next. Uh, I have a fossil to show you that is pretty cool. <laughs> I've got two. So this is petrified wood. And if you have ever looked at pictures or been to um, the petrified wood forest in New Mexico, what's the what's the actual name of the park? Mm. I don't know. There is a like official name that is a little different than that. It's not called petrified wood forest. It's petrified tree forest. It's something just like that. But... Something similar to that. We stopped by there when we when we moved to Nevada. When we drove through New Mexico. And it was incredible to see these huge pieces of petrified wood. They were so long and large. And in some of them, you could even see growth rings. But if you were to try and set this on fire, you could not burn it because it's no longer wood. This is now rock because mineralization has happened. What used to be wood has had these minerals seep into it over millions of years. And those minerals have bonded and crystallized. And anything that used to be wood is gone now. But in its place, you have a rock that has the exact same shape and even the tree rings sometimes that the petrified that the wood had before it was petrified. Depending on the minerals that you get in your rock, 
you might have different colors. This is also a piece of petrified wood, but you can see that it looks very different. But you can still see the, the shape and the pattern of the wood and even some of the texture that you would have had on the bark of the tree. <coughs> now, I think this is my, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I have allergies every spring because of the mulberry trees and I feel like I have been coughing more on this show and like clearing my throat and blowing my nose more than I ever have before. So apologies for that. This, and I want to ask you who are watching in the chat, if you have a guess what this is, this is fossilized. And if you have a guess to what it is, put it in the chat. It came from an animal and it's fossilized. And it came from a turtle, actually, a prehistoric turtle type animal. It's a fossilized piece of poop. I kid you not. So <laughs> the technical the technical name for this is, oh no, I lost my paper, Coralite. This is Coralite fossilized reptile poop from millions of years ago. And you can see that it looks kind of like a turd, but it is not any longer. Now it's a rock because that mineralization has taken place and it has been turned into rock. Let's talk a little bit about what rocks are because rocks are so fascinating and there are so many different types of rocks. You've probably heard of igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. And we're gonna go through some cool examples of those right now. So let's start with igneous. If you guys um, enjoy playing Minecraft, you have probably heard of obsidian and you'd be able to tell me obsidian is a dark colored rock. And here is a piece of obsidian right here. And you can see that it has very smooth and shiny surfaces. And it's a tool that you can actually, it's something that we used to make tools because if you hit it just right with another rock, you can get obsidian to break into these fragments that are quite sharp. And in Nevada, in the desert, you can still, you can find today, if you're going out exploring, you will come across obsidian arrowheads because the Native American people who lived here would use obsidian to make tools, especially arrowheads. Now, obsidian is hard and very dense and pretty brittle. And I'm gonna have math out. If you'll come here and hold up this piece, hold up this tank of water. All right. If we put obsidian into water, it's of course, it's gonna sink. It's a heavy rock. But there are other types of igneous rocks that won't sink. So first here is a piece of rock that is made from an ash fall. And you can see that when the volcano was erupting, you had ash fall and then you had more ash come and then more ash. And as that ash fell and deposited, we get this striping of different colors because um, it was coming with different types of minerals from the volcano. Rocks that come from lava, that come from volcanoes are igneous rocks, that's what we call them. This one also sinks and is heavy. But this is a piece of pumice. And when pumice comes out of a volcano, there is so much air mixed in with this type of material that it's very light and it floats. But you didn't know that there are rocks that can float. Math Dad was totally surprised by this. Uh, it's floating really well, too. It's not, yeah. not sinking like, at all. And if you're like, well, I'm going to make this rock sink. I'll push it down into the water. It's like, nope, I'm going to float. <laughs> and the reason it's floating is because there's so many little air pockets in this piece of hummus. So you can see that igneous rocks have a lot of variety. You might think like, oh, and you can put that down now, <laughs> Math Dad, thank you. <laughs> You might think that, oh, if a rock's coming from lava, all those lava rocks are going to look the same. They're all going to be black and dark like obsidian. But no, there's a lot of variety with different types of igneous rocks. And whether you get pumice or whether you get basalt or obsidian, it has to do with the minerals, with the elements that are in that rock. Most rocks, if you were to look at the entire crust of our planet and say, okay, what is it made of? Silicon and oxygen make up a big percentage of the material that is in a rock. A lot of a rock is made of silicon and oxygen, but you can have huge changes in how that rock behaves and in what mineral it is just by adding a little sprinkling of a few extra elements. Let's take a look at, ooh, I've got so many fun examples here. I'm trying to decide what to do next. Let's take a look at quartz. Quartz is a pretty simple rock and it is, it is mostly made of silicon and oxygen, but it has a very distinct crystal structure. Anytime you have quartz, if you look at it under a microscope, you are gonna see a similar shape to what I have right here, 
where you have this beautiful structure. But quartz can't is quartz is a mineral that can really change its color a lot. If you add just a couple other minerals or elements to it, you'll get a completely different color. So this quartz is white. This quartz is not. And you can get all sorts of variations in between this dark smoky quartz and this clear quartz just with adding a few atoms of different minerals, it will completely change the color. And a similar thing can happen with diamonds. You have industrial grade diamonds that are super hard and are used in machines and you know to, to make things. And then you have gem grade diamonds that are used in jewelry. And then you have diamonds that are not good for either one because their structure is different. And it's just tiny changes in the structure that make the difference between a worthless diamond, a gem grade diamond, and an industrial strength diamond. And similar things can happen with almost any other mineral. So when you, when you say something's different with the structure, the, the, just the, the lattice of yes, molecules Yes, so most, didn't most minerals, up. and in fact, the, the next one we're going to bring up is halite, rock salt. Most minerals are made out of crystal structures. So you have, you have atoms that are lined up in a certain way, and the way they're lined up determines what structure it has. So let me bring two, two more rocks up here. This is gypsum, and you can see that it is very plane-like. There are these planes, and if you break it, it will often break along those lines. And so we've got sort of this blocky, ridge-like structure to the gypsum. Will you hold this for me, Math Dad, mm -hmm. right here? And gypsum is what is used to make drywall. There's a really good chance that the building you're in right now has a drywall. So the, the sheetrock the sheet that in the makes wall. the walls is made out of drywall and gypsum is a main ingredient in drywall. And that's what the walls are in the room that we're in. They, they have sheetrock, which is made from this mineral. I always thought it would be softer. It's, it's not particularly soft, but I mean, in terms of like, if we dropped it on the floor real hard, it would break. Whereas a piece of granite, if you drop it on the floor, it's not gonna break, it's gonna break your floor. So here, this is a piece of halite. And if I bring this closer and I know whoo, oh. it's so light in color that at first the webcam was like, ah, I'm being blinded. But you can see that we have really intricate structures and they're cube shaped. And you can actually make your own version of rock salt by boiling water and adding salt and then putting a string or something in there and letting it cool. It takes a couple weeks, but you'll get rock salt crystals as the water evaporates, you'll get those forming. And halite is formed kind of the same way where you have these deposits from salt water from, you know, or an inland sea, you have these deposits of salt and then over time they form crystals. And then with added pressure and temperature changes, you can get even more interesting things happening. Now let's talk about sedimentary rocks real quick. So igneous rocks come from volcanoes or lava. So you have lava and material coming from volcanoes that makes igneous rocks. Sedimentary rocks come from pieces, tiny little pieces of things being deposited and forming a layer of sediment. So the word sediment means like you can kind of think of it as like tiny little pieces falling down and they form a layer just like snowfall makes a layer of snow. Little pieces of rock make a layer of sediment. And the most common type of sedimentary rock that you've probably heard of is sandstone. Uh, and shout out to anyone who likes to play Minecraft. They have sandstone blocks in Minecraft as well. And sandstone, if you look at it under a microscope, you can see little grains of sand all stuck together. And you can also erode sandstone. If you rub against it, you'll get those little grains rubbing off. But there are other types of sedimentary rock as well. And one of them is limestone. Limestone actually forms in the ocean. So instead of having sand like from a sand dune gathering to make sandstone, you have um, pieces of coral and other minerals that gather together and make limestone. But what do you think happens if you take a sedimentary rock and then you heat it up? Um, it gets warm. Interesting things can happen, very interesting things. So let's, I wanna show you one more um, sedimentary rock before we go on to metamorphic, because metamorphic will be talking about what happens when you have temperature and pressure. So there is a canyon in Death Valley called Marble Canyon, and it has the most amazing conglomerate rocks. So a conglomerate rock is when you have 
rocks of different sizes coming together to make a sedimentary rock, sort of like a sandstone. So this was an old riverbed. And here's another one with um, one of my kids from picture several, several years old. She doesn't look anything like that now. And you can see that those, there's a layer of bigger rocks and then there are smaller rocks. Conglomerate rocks are really amazing because they tell you so much about what was happening. You can tell how fast water was running, what direction a river was going. And a lot of times in conglomerate rocks, you're looking at ancient riverbeds that now have been preserved in rock form, which is kind of amazing. All right, Matt, Dad, are you ready to make a metamorphic rock? Okay, just, just, just a sec. So with igneous rock, that was from volcanoes, so rocks that had been melted and cooled. Yep. Sedimentary rock, you've got just layers, layers. that have formed. And then your so metamorphic rock is when you add a bunch of heat and pressure over a long period of time. And those are the hardest ones, right? And um, metamorphic rock is, and hardness can vary between the different rocks, but a metamorphic rock is kind of like an, a mismatch or like a, a mashup of, of different rocks. So it's something that has been transformed through heat and pressure. And you can have a sedimentary rock that can become metamorphic, or you can have an igneous rock that can become metamorphic. If you add extra pressure and heat, then you change you change the rock. We're going to, first I'm gonna show you an example that we did with bubble gum, and then I'll show you some real life examples of metamorphic rocks, and then how we can make our own with frozen peanut butter. So here, here is how this looked last night. Last night, I took a glass jar, and I put a whole bunch of gumballs in it, and some, um, what are those things called? Chewy Tootsie Rolls. Yeah. yeah, chewy Tootsie Rolls. And then we put it in the oven and we put a weight on top of it that was full of water and we left it there, not at too high of a temperature. It was about, about 200 degrees. We left it there for quite a while and then we added even a little extra pressure and pushed down. You ready to see what our metamorphic bubble gum looks like now? Whoa, it has fused together into one solid piece. And you can see that there are some interesting changes. Some of the colors ran together a little bit. And if I were to just show this to you and ask you what it was, would you guess bubble gum and um, Tootsie Rolls? Probably not. Probably no. not. And here's the cool thing about metamorphic rock. You often get these interesting patterns and colors that are quite different from the original parent material. You really do end up with a new rock. It does look quite lovely. And I'm I'm curious if we're gonna be able to get it out. I tried this morning to go around the edge with a knife and it was trickier than I anticipated. So we're gonna have some fun trying to get our, reclaim our pan after this is over. <laughs> All right, so real life metamorphic rock. The first one I wanna show you is marble. If you take limestone, so here's our block of limestone. If you take limestone and you heat it up and add pressure, you actually get marble. And marble has some of the same properties of limestone, but it's a lot harder. And because it is harder and because it gets these beautiful swirling patterns through it as it's heated and as you get that pressure, marble is a really popular rock to use for sculptures and was really prized and used a lot in architecture and in sculptures down in the past. Another type of metamorphic rock that we have is called nice. Not spelled like I'm being nice to you, spelled like G-N-E-I-S-S, -S. nice. So this rock, you can see we've got some interesting patterns with the way that the colors are. And then if you're able to look close, you can see some crystalline structures that are really beautiful. I was wondering if it was nice or knee, nice. Or, yeah, that's, okay. I, 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 you can see the word, but you don't know how, how to say it. You don't know how it. to pronounce it. Yep, I didn't know either. A geologist told me, because I was like, how do you say this? Now, um, is oh, it, is, is this Sarah, Sarah says use parchment paper or wax paper if you do it at home to make it easier to lift out. Where were you last night when I needed you, Sarah? <laughs> That's a genius suggestion. You should definitely do that. Prep your pan first. I oiled my pan, but that was not that was not good enough. The oil just like merged to the bubble gum. So I've got granite here. Is granite? Granite is an igneous rock. And mm, I have really? a piece, yes, and I have a piece of granite here as well. And the main difference between granite and obsidian has to do with how quickly they cool down. So um, of course, mineral, what, what minerals you have in here makes a big difference as well. 
But if you have an igneous rock that is cooling very, very slowly, um, granite is one that cools very slowly. Obsidian does not cool quite as slowly. So how fast igneous rock cools down makes a big difference with the rock that you end up getting at the end. Now, I feel like, oh my goodness, there are so many more things I want to say. We're just going to go real quick to, to two of the coolest. I have more rocks that I could show you, and maybe, maybe we'll do another, another geology lesson on rocks later. Uncut and unpolished rocks look very different than polished rocks. So this is a piece of chrysola, or chryscola, chryscola, and it has copper in it, and that's what gives it this beautiful blue, bluish color. And it looks kind of chalky when it's uncut and unpolished, but if you polish it, then you get this beautiful deep color, and all you did was just really smooth that surface and polish it down. Here, here's a piece of feldspar that got polished and... Labradorite. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. So the, the back end, not polished, not, not nearly as smooth, but yeah, this polished face. The polished is face is as amazing. And it's just small, minor differences in the, in the minerals that are in here, the number of, you know, the elements that you have in here that make all of this variety with rocks. Um, the last thing that I want to show you with rocks is that some rocks can change color in UV light. And this is kind of amazing. So I have a UV flashlight here, and you can leave that on. The best, way, the best way to show you is actually if I hold the light here and sort of point it toward the rock. And you can see that right in the middle there, whoa, we've got a piece of something that is fluorescing this beautiful blue color. And depending on what minerals you have, you can get really surprising results. Here's one that fluoresces orange. This one looks like just an ordinary rock, but when you fluoresce it, you see that Whoa, there's all this green showing up. Here is a piece of pumice. And if you do UV light on it, you see absolutely nothing because there is nothing in there that will fluoresce. But if you take this piece of chert, it turns orange. And this piece of fluorite glows an incredible blue color. And this looks super impressive in person, but it's such a bright neon blue that my web camera just couldn't couldn't handle it. So you have to just trust me that it looks a lot like this one does, but the whole entire rock is going bright blue. Now, when we're talking about what rocks are made out of, you need to know something about particle size. So the, the last little exercise that we're gonna do is all about the size of particles. So I have here a cup of dirt, and I'm going to add water to this cup of dirt and then we're gonna stir it around. And I forgot my, um, forgot to get a stick. So I'm going to use, oh, I'll get one. I was gonna use a pen, but then Matt was like, you should have seen his face. He was like, oh, don't use the pen. Maybe a pen. Oh. All right, we're gonna use our grabber that we made a few days ago, sacrifice it for science to stir up some dirt. So if you take dirt and you stir it and get it moving, all of the particles are going to move around. If you stir it really fast, they'll start moving around the cup. But then if you stop stirring, they start to settle. And this looks almost like a, a miniature snowstorm. If you watch closely, you can see them starting to settle down. And they settle from largest to smallest. And after about two minutes, all of the sand will have settled. And then the next layer that you get is silt. And then after that, you will get clay. So let me show you now a cup that we poured last night and stirred last night and how it settled. So this is soil from our backyard and you can see that most of it is sand, but then we get this little layer of silt up here on the top. We really don't have any clay in our backyard because we live in Nevada and most of our, most of our soil is sand, but I drove down to the dry lake bed that is near where I live and this one, we do have some clay and silt and you can see how this layer here it took almost 24 hours for this layer to settle. This is the clay, and then we've got a bit of silt, and then the sand at the bottom. So if you want to find out the dirt that is around your house, you know, what is it made of? How much is sand? How much is silt? How much is clay? You can just put some in a cup, add water, stir it around, and then watch as it settles. And depending on the type of sand, silt, and clay, I, I saw very different recommendations for when to mark 
but I like to say mark with a Sharpie where the top of the dirt is at two hours and then, sorry, two minutes, two hours, and then 24 hours. And that will give you sort of a, a little guideline of what particle size you have because the sand settles almost instantly. So within two minutes, all the sand will be settled. The silt takes longer, but after about two hours, you should have a layer of some silt. And then 24 hours later, a full day later, you'll see if you have any clay. And do those make different types of rocks? Or do you crush sand they, versus crushing silt? They do, and they, they're especially important when we're talking about soil. So sand particles are a lot bigger, and clay particles are super small, and they're also sort of flat, and they stick together really well. That's why if you get sand wet and you walk through some wet sand, like on the beach, your feet aren't going to really be that, that dirty, and you can just walk on top of it. But if you walk across some wet clay, you're going to have, you know, these big rafts of clay stuck to your feet because the clay is sticks to itself so well. And the I, good question here, is that clay the same as playing clay? Um, the clay that you can play with, it depends on if it's oil-based clay or like the clay that you would make pottery from. The clay that you would make pottery from, yes, it's very similar to that clay. But the oil-based clay that's the beautiful bright colors that you can mold and play with that doesn't dry out, that clay is different. <clears throat> all right, I don't want to eat up all of Math Dad's time, but I do want to show you how you can make your own metamorphic rock out of frozen peanut butter real fast. Ooh. If you can grab, grab me some peanut butter. We're also going to be using some Rice Krispies and some um, rolled oats, but you can use any materials you want. And the, the main point of this is that when you apply heat and pressure, when you change the temperature and the pressure, you can change the rock a lot. And we often think of rocks as not being, not being things that can be moved, but they can be. It just takes higher pressure and temperature than we're comfortable with, and it often takes a long time as well. So I, whoops, I froze some little balls of peanut butter. Some of them are mixed with chocolate, and so with the cocoa powder, they look dark brown, and others are light brown. And if I add some of these frozen things of peanut butter here, and then fill in the space with some other food, like my little Rice Krispie cereal and my rolled oats. We could say that I just made a sedimentary rock. If, this, if these rock layers were kind of stuck together, this would be a sedimentary rock. But we don't want to make a sedimentary rock. We want to make a metamorphic rock. And the nice thing about our frozen peanut butter is that the temperature that it is solid at is a lot colder than how it is right now. So if I just leave it at room temperature, let it sit for about 15 minutes till it warms up, and then if I push on it with my hand, I can make my own metamorphic rock by changing the temperature and the pressure. And then this one, you can eat afterwards, and I recommend eating this one more than eating the bubblegum um, one because the bubblegum one turned out to be really, really hard and rock-like. This one is gonna be a softer rock. Okay, I, I stepped in that container of water and now my foot's all wet. But just, <coughs> oh, what, what, did you, what did you say to do? You said to heat let it? it. Let it. No, just let it come to room temperature because the peanut butter is soft at room temperature, but in the freezer it's hard and like a rock. So we're letting it come up to room temperature, and then we can push it down. Okay, so you still you still have to apply the, the pressure to get it to stick together. Huh? Yes. Interesting. All right. Um, I we didn't even have time today to talk about eons. I. We're going to save that for later and just bump that to another day because eons and geological time is amazing. And I had this cool graphic to share with you guys, but I don't want to eat up all of Math Dad's time. So we're going to move on to fact or fiction. All right. Actually, before we do that, a reminder. So I'm going to post a link here. I want you guys to go and fill out the form. And so the address here although you've got to get the capital and lowercase letters right i don't so think you're going to copy that yeah, easier to grab it from the link yeah and if you're not able i mean if, if you're if you're watching on a, a tablet or device or on your tv and you're not able to get on the google form don't worry about it but if you can we would love for you to help us out so that we can run a little experiment in a few minutes that's right all right fact or fiction time i'm ready <laughs> all right Fact number one, the Himalayas grow six inches taller each year. We talked about this yesterday, that they were growing. Six inches sounds entirely plausible to me. Six inches, it's true. It's actually false. Oh. It's six centimeters, which is smaller than six inches. That's about two, two and a half-ish yes, inches. 
Um, it depends on the estimate though, because the, some estimates estimate a lot less, some estimates estimate more, but between a centimeter to six centimeters ish is how much we think the Himalayas are growing each year. But the cool thing to think about is that they are growing of being pushed up, but they are also weathering and you know, the rain and snow and ice are making them smaller at the same time. So it's kind of like a contest between those two forces with how high they get. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Second fact, small scorpions are more venomous than large scorpions. Okay. Um, it kind of makes sense that smaller things need better defense mechanisms. And I have this vague memory of these bark scorpions coming into Nevada for, that weren't native and they were the bad ones and, I was, and they were small. So I'm going to say true. Mostly true. It does sort of depend on, um, depend on species and what you're talking about. So there are more than 2000 different types of scorpions. Only about 20 of them are, have venom that is strong enough that it can really harm or even kill a person, be fatal to a person. Most scorpions, if you get stung by them, it's just going to be like a bee sting. And for most people, it's not going to be serious at all. We have several native scorpions to Nevada, like the giant hairy um, scorpion, and they get pretty large. The Arizona bark scorpion is very small. It only gets up to about an inch and a half length size. Usually they're smaller than that, and they are way more venomous. So in general, smaller species, the smaller species of scorpions tend to be the more poisonous ones. But within a species, like if you have a baby bark scorpion versus an adult bark scorpion, there have been some studies that have shown that the baby venom is stronger, but the amount of venom it delivers is smaller. They end up being pretty equal. Okay, so you use the word poisonous in there. But venomous, venomous is the correct word. Okay. Yes. Poisonous is something you eat, whereas venomous is something that is injected. injected. Okay. Yes. Um, guess what I have? Is it a scorpion? It is a scorpion. Oh. Do you guys want to meet Scorpio? So yeah. this is a temporary pet we have, and I will say she was found on. Um, in it within city limits and we're not collecting her illegally or anything like that and we fed her a mealworm yesterday and she loved it and i know she's a little hard to see in there with all the sand but if i shine some uv light on her she glows and then you can see her really well isn't that cool yeah scorpions are amazing and we, we're not keeping her in this jar we have a much larger container but it was difficult to see through the larger container and so i put her in there temporarily just for our show so i could show you her um, scorpions have the most incredible mouth parts. When we fed her the, the mealworm, it's like their mouths are actually like two little scissor hands that sort of, they're, they're such incredible animals. And they're not insects, they're not spiders. They're in the arachnid family, more closely related to spiders than insects, but they're kind of like their own little, their own little branch. Yeah. yeah. Re really cool. I can't believe how brightly that glowed. It's, it's good black, black light. Yeah. And um, the, the giant desert scorpion, the, the type that this one is, our little pet Scorpio, is not venomous, um, similar to a bee sting. And it's also a fairly shy creature. When I was trying to get her to come into this, this jar, I sort of guided her gently with a little spatula. And I thought she might attack the spatula, but she was just, she was cowering in fear and I felt sort of bad for her. And then as soon as she got in the jar, she was like, aha, a new space and scuttled right in. Nice. All right. All right. Last one. The melting temperature of granite is 1,215 degrees Celsius. That is so high that granite can actually withstand being in lava and not melt. Whoa. Okay. That's, that is crazy high because most, most metals will melt by then. Oh, da, da, da. Granite can just hang out in lava and not melt. Did we say granite was lava rock? We said it was igneous. What? <laughs> False. True. The chat says true. Dang. Okay, this is another one that's a little bit, um, <laughs> it kind of depends. Mostly true. So if you have a big piece of granite and there is a lava flow approaching it, by the time the lava flow has come out of the volcano and is flowing down a hill, it's going to have cooled down a little bit below 1,200 degrees Celsius. And so the granite will likely not melt. But if you took a hunk of rock, uh, granite rock and tossed it in a lava lake, it would melt because once you get down deeper into the lava, the temperature is, is higher. So it sort of depends on what type of lava you're talking about. Lava that's flowing down a mountain and is cooling down would be cooler, but lava like inside a volcano, definitely not. It would melt the granite. I see. So you, you word these in such a way that I can be both right and wrong every time. And that way, you're, <laughs> oh, oh, so close, math, that's so close. <laughs> No, it was just an interesting, interesting thought experiment. Yeah, Gets yeah. you thinking about those igneous rocks. Indeed. 
All right, is it math time? It is math time. All right, today we're gonna to be talking about histograms. So this, this next week, we wanna actually be getting into some hypothesis testing. So we need to know how to talk about data and how to uh, visualize things, how to, how to summarize a, a lot of numbers and the key tool, the, the easiest and most useful one of all is a histogram. So what is a histogram? And perhaps, so let, let me just say one more time, maybe your very last chance of pasting a link into the chat. And if you will uh, fill out this form, you can participate, but, and, and then. And the goal is to be the one who picks the smallest number that no one else picks. Uh, the, so sometimes the answer is one. If you're the only one who picks the number one, then you, you might win, win right away. But if someone else takes that chance and says, I'm gonna try one, then you lose. That's right. So it's a really interesting game. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it in, it's different in, in, in every just time. a minute. But um, Okay, so what is a histogram? A histogram is a way of summarizing data in a nice visual manner. So if when I say data, I'm just talking about a bunch of numbers, so quantitative data. So if I write down the rolls of a die, so in, in this case, I have two, three, four, five, five, four, one, six. So I suppose I'd rolled a die multiple times to get this. All right, how might we describe it? Well, one thing we might do is just count up how many of each item there were. So I could make a table. So the, the numbers, when you roll a die, one, two, three, four, five, and six are the possible numbers. And then their frequency, is how often they occurred. All right, so how many ones were there? There was one, one. How many twos were there? There was one, two. How many threes? <laughs> one, three. I did two fours, two fives, and I did a six. So was that very random? Yeah, who, who knows? R randomness is, is difficult, but I, I just started writing down some numbers. And then, okay, so now we could visualize this by plotting the data. So along the horizontal axis here, I can just put those numbers. So we had the one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then we can say, all right, how many times did each one occur? So here was our number, and here is the frequency with which that number occurred. And so that the number one showed up, so I'm just gonna draw me a box for the, because it only occurred one time. Number two showed up one time. Number three showed up one time. Number four showed up two times. So my box has to have height two. Five showed up two times. And six showed up one time. So we get this shape here, which I'm just gonna color it in here. It looks kind of like a bar chart. The difference between a histogram and a bar chart or at least the one obvious difference is there's actually no gap between the bars. There's just some region that's filled in. All right, so now that we see this, we can answer a bunch of questions. We could say, all right, what number was the most commonly rolled number? Well, that one was tied between four and five. Uh, it, it wasn't a very big data set, not, not super interesting, but you, could, you can imagine if this list was 100 numbers long, then the shape of this would, would give us some information. Maybe if we rolled it enough, we'd might start suspecting, hey, that number's showing up way too often. Maybe that's not a fair die. Maybe maybe the yeah, the labels or the weighting is off on it somehow. So this, this histogram though allows us to collect the data and display it in a nice visual way. So if if I were to make a histogram of the ages of everyone who's viewing this, my guess is there are probably Plenty of kids watching, there are probably lots of parents. Maybe the number of teenagers is not as high, or maybe the, the number of 80 year olds is not as high. I, I don't know, but I, I'm suspecting we'd probably see the biggest hump around kids' ages. And yeah, that, that, that would be an interesting chart to show. There's no, no way of collecting that with, that, I, that I can think of that would, would work out. But I did want to collect something from you today. So we, we asked this question, and maybe Science Mom can start trying to pull it up while I continue talking here. So she'll be working on something. So we, we're playing this game where... We have 260 answers so far. All right, so 260 is the, the total we're gonna use. 
I'm going to open that up in a Google Sheet, and then if you can even get the screen on that Google Sheet so they can, okay. can view it. But okay, so that this question was, or can you pick us the smallest number that no one else chooses? And it's a really interesting game because it doesn't seem to have a good strategy. So if, if there was one number that was the best number to pick, well, then everybody would pick it, and then it wouldn't be a good number to choose. Ah, so, but I wonder what the data is going to look like. Are a lot of people going to pick the number one? Or maybe people will think, ah, everyone's going to pick one, so I'll pick two. Maybe a lot of people will think about that, and they'll all pick two. Or maybe some people will think, ah, everybody will pick one and two. Maybe I'll pick three. Or maybe a lot of different numbers in between. And this is the first time we've played this game, so I don't think you have a lot of intuition one way or another on it. All right. All right, are we ready to sort the data? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead and sort it. All right, hopefully it'll... Ooh, quite a few uh, people. People are not picking whole numbers here. So right, gonna... I like the creativity with doing zero. Just a sec, gotta hide, hide this column of names so they don't distract us here. All right, uh, yeah, people trying to pick, yeah. Zero, zero point zero one. No, no, whole numbers only. That's okay. That's all right. Zero is not a whole number. Um, no, zero, zero. It will work. But I did ask for positive oh, whole numbers, and zero, and zero is, not is not positive. Positive. Gotcha. All right. So there are mul right. multiple people picked one. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to select all 260 of these Can't you responses. Just, like, click on the column and select the whole column. Um, I don't know. Actually, I, I, maybe, maybe you can do it that way. All right, you're Whoa. almost there. 272, 280. Wait a minute. Uh, more are coming in. It's automatically updating. Oh, it's updating? Well, that's cool. Wow. I, I didn't realize <laughs> it would update live. <laughs> now, now I feel all powerful. All right. At any rate, so what I'm going to do is do insert and then chart. And I'm going to try to make a histogram out of this. All right. Oh, what is that? Someone picked a really big number. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. All right, so we want to try to edit this. So chart style. I just did this before, and it, histogram was the, was the first one that did it. Hitting delete. Insert chart. Why not? You know what, oh, line chart, there it is. No, I don't want line chart. I want... Oh, it was down there. Histogram was there? Yeah, scroll down. Scroll down. So, histogram. <sighs> So, so, so someone picked a, a, a number with like 12 digits, and because right. of that, the, the data is all, that's kind of funny. All right, no, no, we're, all right, you, you guys are hilarious, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you can sort, no. sort it by, and just, and just select. Just like, so I'm going to take this one is equal to, and I'm just going to pick the, oops, the minimum of that guy. Or the biggest number I'm going to let you pick is 300. Uh, okay. And now I should be able to make this column be smaller. All right. Way to go, Math Dad. Everyone give him claps for his Excel skills. All right. I'll accept it. Kept going. <laughs> All right. Well, may maybe we'll succeed on this. Maybe we won't. All right. At any rate. Oh, there we go. It did. It worked. Okay. So trying to. Make a histogram out of this now. Oh man, so we gotta get it go up as well. That's, that's all right. I'd say just go with, go with what we've got. <laughs> okay, so pick this column, and then you're saying insert chart, and ooh. Okay, so it's it's given me a line chart there. I don't want a line chart. I wanted a histogram. All right, and now I just need to change the bin size, which I do in customize, and. No. You know, I have to say, I'm glad that you guys get to see me and Math Dad have have little struggle moments because this is what real science is like. It doesn't always go well the first time you do it. You usually have hiccups. Yeah. So I'm glad you get to see us have hiccups. Um. Well, let's talk about what we see right now. What we see is a heck of a lot of people picked numbers that were below 20. Yep. Some people pick numbers between 21 and 43 there. And then things are tapering off. This is kind of what I expected. I expected a lot of low guesses. I didn't expect people to be choosing gazillion. So here, 300 or more. Yeah, people were picked, a lot of people picked really big, big numbers. numbers. 
I think you're just just for fun trying to get revenge for me singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. Uh, I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. All right. There. Okay. I, I managed to shrink the bin size. Now, unfortunately, it's still so wide. We can't see this. I wanted to find the answer just from visualizing this chart. And as I do, I'm seeing really tall bins, but what I need to find is the smallest number where only one person selected it. And that's actually gonna be too hard. So I'm, I'm going to try to, one, one final attempt at this, I'm going to select that whole column. Oh man. Clear it out and I'm going to, Say that this is equal to the minimum of previous column, and I'm going to just say 30. Now I'm going to remake it one last time, and yeah, maybe we'll succeed, maybe we won't. And what we see happening when we insert a histogram, oh, line chart again, what histogram? Aha! So Oh, so my bin size is off. How did I how did I switch the bin size again? I went to customize. Instagram bin size is one. Aha. So what's the smallest number where only one value showed up? I guess is 20, 21 there. Ooh. Um, yeah, the scale's actually so big I can't read it. I thought if I hovered it would say the number. Man. Yeah, Excel's mad at you today. It's like you put Appar too much in. Apparently. You can tell I actually don't work with spreadsheets that often, but people who do would would recognize this right away. All right, we might have. I'm trying <laughs> to drag that over, and it's not working. Um, all right. I'm gonna. All right. Good so, job, Math Dad. Thanks. So I actually don't know what the winner is yet. I'm gonna go in and 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 actually figure go, this out in a minute if I can. Later. But yeah, okay, uh, yeah, kind kind of a an interesting game. A lot of people guessed number one, thinking ah, no one else will. Well, boy, a lot of people thought number one was good. And this, this is a really fun kind of number game to play when you are, um, yeah, just play with a small group of people. So if you have, you know, several people in your family, you can say, okay, numbers between one and 10, whoever picks the smallest one, you know, gets to say what we have for dessert or whatever. And it's different every time you play it. Sometimes everyone will hedge their bets with guessing small numbers. Other times no one will, and one will work. And sometimes you have skipped numbers where you know several people pick one, two, and three, and then you get nothing until like 12, and 12 ends up being your lowest number. That's right. It all depends. So the crazy thing is, somebody who picked that huge number might actually win because they might. everyone else might pick duplicates. It's unlikely with some of those big numbers, but wow. So tell us real quick, Math Dad, why are, why are histograms useful? So you're able to just visualize the data. You can get a sense for where the center of the data is, how spread out things are, and, if you know what the shape of the data looks like, you know what type of questions are going to be interesting. You might be like, wow, why is the data concentrated there? Why, why do we see such a big spike at that one bin and, and not in other places? Or other times, like, huh, why is it so uniform? I would have expected spikes in certain places. So it, it helps to guide questions and it helps us to summarize things in a way where you can just look at it and get a ton of information for very little effort. So yeah, it's yeah. a great way to organize information. And we'll have some more math lessons about statistics later on this week. All right, should I give my math challenge right now while we're at the board? Yes. So my math challenge for today and involved. You, you gotta tell them what the answer was for yesterday. Oh, I do, don't I? Yeah. All right. So yesterday's question was to take uh, 10 dots and arrange them into five rows of four. And the secret there is draw a star and just put the dots at either the endpoints or where the lines intersect. And voila, five rows of four with exactly 10 dots. Okay. That's pretty slick. Yeah, a fun one. All right, so then in today's math mystery, you're going to draw a square and then you're going to connect the midpoints. So you get another square only rotated. You can do the same thing again, middle square, inside a square, inside a square, inside a square. 
and on and on forever and yeah, ever. On and on forever and ever. And then we're going to shade all of these triangles on, on every other one. Oh, did you shade the wrong one? I did. Sorry. So on the, on the triangles that are pointing north, south, east, or west. Here, I'm just going to show them the picture. Yeah. Okay. And you're trying to figure out what portion of that overall figure is shaded. So that's our math mystery for today. All right. Okay. Now I have a riddle for Math Dad. And then we are going to show you our engineering challenge for today, which is to make a hexaflexagon. So I'm going to move our view back over this direction, and then we'll have some Q&A and our art showcase. So you ready for this, Math Dad? I am so ready for this. All right. My riddle is... I fit with others, but I cannot talk. Is it crayon? Nope. Okay. Crayons fit with others? Yeah, the whole box of crayons, they fit together beautifully, oh, okay. and they don't so. talk. That's true, they don't talk. All right. I create pictures, but I cannot see. It's a crayon. It's not a crayon. <laughs> Arva47201 has it. Puzzle piece? Yes, Okay. A puzzle piece. Or a so, crayon. Or, well, <laughs> I suppose. But puzzle pieces fit together. They, they, they do fit together even better, better than, than crayons. crayons do, so that's, for that's sure. True. Now, if you have not seen or heard about flexahexagons before, prepare to have your mind blown because these little paper creations are awesome and you can make them pretty easily. So you can see that I have this hexagon shaped piece of paper here. On one side, it's plain. On the other side, there are dots. So how many sides would you say this little object has, Math Dad? Two sides. Two sides. But if I fold it together like this, I can open it up. <gasps> Where did the stripes come from? That now I have stripes and dots. And if I fold it together again, then I've got the blank side. Wait, what's, on, what's on the back? Fold it together, stripes, blank. And then we can go stripes, dots. And then I can fold it again and go back to dots and blank. So you're, you're able to get three different sides. Three different Some, sides. Somehow one of them's hidden every time. Yes, but how is it hidden? How can you just, you know, real quickly switch them out like this? Isn't that cool? They're amazing. Mm -hmm. You can play with these for hours. They're like... The infinity cube like type thing. Yes, yes, yes they're so cool. Viheart has a series of four videos and if you Google hexaflexagons, those videos will come up right away. They have millions of views. They're really well done where she talks about the math behind this and how they work. But today I'm going to show you how to fold them because they are tricky to make. So don't feel discouraged if your first several attempts at a hexaflexagon fail. So did Math Dad's and so did mine. Um, and here's here's yeah, how to all make of them. Mine failed. All of Math Dad has I, not yet I, I, successfully I, made one. One of these days. <laughs> so I, I made a template that is like this and I made a template that is, you know, hold that up for me. So this template, has all of the dotted lines where you can cut and then you know where to fold. But this one is actually harder to use than this one. So this one, I made an equilateral triangle in the middle, and then here's how you want to do it. You can make it from any size strip of paper. You just need to have an equilateral triangle in the middle to get started. And an equilateral triangle is going to have 60 degrees on each side, and it's gonna have kind of the cool property that when you, when you line it up, it's all even. And then you can start to just accordion out from one to the other so that it matches. So I'm gonna fold it right there, and then I'm gonna fold it there, and then I'm gonna fold it there, and I keep on folding until I've used up my whole paper and everything matches, and I'm doing this fast and so I'm not being as accurate as I would like to be, but I want everything to match that original, that original triangle so that I get a little accordion of triangles. And you need nine triangles. And once you have nine triangles, then the trick is that you want to fold them into a hexagon shape. So you're gonna start out, if you go like this, then you've got one, two, three, you're almost there. And this, this is the tricky part. You need to make sure, and I've gotta do it this way so that I can see my paper as well. You've gotta make sure that your that your, your little folds are not next to each other or cutting it in half, they need to be alternating. So if you go like this and you have a flappy flap there, a flappy flap there, and then here's where you're gonna glue across and you get a flappy flap there, your three flappy flaps make a triangle, like a 
120 degree angle thing, then you're good. So I've got to say that this makes sense that you needed nine triangles because that would be nine times two, you would get you 18 sides. And if you look at the hexaflexagon, there were six showing at each point in time, but then there were three different patterns. So six times three is also 18. So, Ooh, so, so cool we had to have at least nine triangles. That makes I'm, sense. I'm gonna undo this one so that I can show you just a little bit better. Once, once you get your nine triangles, it's helpful to leave just a little extra flap on one of them. So here I've got my nine triangles plus an extra little flap. And then again, you wanna fold up so that you get the start of your hexagon and then you are gonna fold this part in front. So, and then fold it over and you have your hexaplex cut. I'll show you that one more time because this part really can be tricky. So you have your accordion triangles, nine of them. You want to get the start of your hexagon where you're gonna have one, two, three triangles on the bottom there. And then you're gonna take this part, fold it back, but you don't wanna fold it and glue it like that. You need to make sure that this triangle comes in front of that first one and then use glue or tape to fix them together and you're all set. Nice. So that's that's our hexaflexagon fun. All right, last but not least, let me share with you the, and um, I see some good questions here about what to use. You can use any strip of paper and once you get your equilateral triangle in the middle, then you can just start accordioning it back and forth and you'll, you'll be set. I recommend um, after you try it a couple times, I recommend using these templates. They're gonna be easier to use than the one where I have all of the triangles drawn out. And again, and there is, um, I'll ask my science moms to please drop the link on the Patreon page. You will find the template, the template there. Now we have just a quick Q and A, a couple questions, and I wanna share the art prompt one more time. So our art prompt for today is actually a photo prompt to do forced perspective you know, make it look like your toy or yourself, make it look like you're holding up a heavy object, like you're getting, you know, you're really small, something where the perspective changes and it's sort of like a trick photo. I like that. Yeah, trick photo, a lot of fun. Okay, a couple quick questions to answer. Um, several people asked, how did I know the scorpion was a she? <sighs> I, I, it's a guess on my part. Oh. It's actually really hard to tell the if a scorpion is male or female. The only for sure way that I would be comfortable with is seeing baby scorpions on the back of a scorpion and then you know, aha, that's the female. But females tend to be a little bit wider and a little bit larger than the males. And this scorpion looks fairly robust to me. So I made the guess that I think that it's a female scorpion, but it's it's entirely possible that I could be calling my little Scorpio a she and the scorpion's like, hey, that's wrong. <laughs> I could be wrong. All right. Um, Couple other questions. What is the oldest type of rock? This is a great question. If you go to the Grand Canyon, there are these rocks that are called Vishnu basement rocks down at the very bottom of the canyon, and they are among some of the oldest rocks on Earth. I actually think that most of the oldest rocks on Earth are probably buried deep enough that we can't even access them, but those rocks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon are among some of the oldest. All right. One or two other questions, and then we will do our slideshow. Yeah, I want, I want to see the artwork that they've come up with. Um, Duck King asks, can a virus get a virus? That is a great question. Not that I know of, but I would say it is within, it's not possible because it, uh -huh. um, a virus doesn't have the machinery to make new viruses. So if a virus did have another virus take it over where it put its genetic information in, that virus wouldn't be able to make more copies. And so then with the virus- Could it hijack really the, the other virus? one though, so that it's just so passing along new DNA? I it's perhaps, perhaps oh. you could have, so you have a virus that has like the capsule on the outside and the little proteins on the outside, um, help it to access a cell and take over the cell. And so if you had a sneaky virus that was like, I will take over your DNA, like put the DNA in, maybe it could hijack it that way. But the thing is there's no machinery inside a virus. And so if you did just put a new little strand of DNA inside a virus, you'd have to manually take the other one out. Um, and a virus isn't going to have the ability to do that. We can do that. We can actually take over mm -hmm. viruses and then use them in the lab to do gene therapy and other things by, by manipulating them. But I don't think a virus can. Well, that's a really good. interesting question. Huh? Yeah, that's a good question. All right. uh, I, so who won the smallest number contest? I actually don't 
know now. We are trying to figure that out live, and it wasn't working. I, we will have to get back to you on this. But uh, it looks to me like this. It's got to be well around around twenty one ish was. All right, I'm yep. just going to open it up again, and if we do a sort. I think the easiest way, rather than making histogram, is just to scroll down. Oh, and that chart is still there. Yep, keep scrolling. Yep, yep, scrolling. So there are lots twos. of twos, threes, fours, fives. There's no six. Really? There was not a single six? Yeah, oh, there no, there were sixes. I missed right. them. Twelves, thirteens, fourteens, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. I didn't 20. see an eighteen. There's no eighteen. Yeah, there, there was no eighteen. No eighteen. There several nineteen. And there's number one 20. twenty. So whoever did number twenty, you are the winner. Indeed. Well done. So now if I've hidden the column. I, th I th somehow thought I'd know how to unhide it. But wh <laughs> why, why would I know something like that? I, I, th I think I got your back, Math Dad. Yeah? Yeah. <gasps> oh, there it is. Okay, so who picked 20? Cleese 34. Cleese 34. Cle woo, woo. Cleese 34 is our winner with the number of number 20. So Bravo. All right. G glad we cl closed that up. So, yeah. Well, I, I had no idea what to expect. But yeah, 20 is pretty high. That is, that is awesome. All right, we are going to close out now with our art slideshow. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you some of the fantastic art submissions that we had today, or rather that we had yesterday, with our prompt to do an undersea lab. And I wanna give a quick thank you to Science Mom Liza and Krista, who helped me with collecting our art slideshow and making it. They go through and look at the art and then compile it together in a slideshow for us. Oh, so, Dr. Drew at Underwater Lab. Awesome, <laughs> that kind of reminds me of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Yeah. Oh, I love the colors on this one. Yeah. And I like how, I mean, all of the labs, you guys know that if we're gonna be underwater, we've gotta have an air bubble. Yeah, a nice glass dome so you yeah. can see what's going on. Great work, Sarah and Lincoln. <laughs> and I saw that Sarah was saying, don't sing the song. <laughs> Great work, Ivan. Ivan. I love all the, the laboratory equipment there. Angelo. Nice. Love the colors here. Penelope. Nice. Ooh, this is a pyramid yeah. underwater. Reminds me of the Louvre. Psychology lab. Earth lab. Ooh, and volcanoes. Explosives lab under and, the water. And vol vol <laughs> volcanology, too. Volcano study. Great job, Luca. Ooh, and this one kind of reminds me of like the actual structure of a volcano with the little columns that go to other other rooms. Yeah, well, this one seems like it moves, too, because it's got thrusters. This is oh, a mobile nice. lab. Great work, Kylie. Hannah loves the song. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the big shark in this one. Mm. Beautiful colors in this. And I like the stack of books too, like a library. Lucy, oh, also a Lucy. mobile lab. Yeah, that looks like a really cool submersible. Yeah. That's good power sources. Under the sea lab. Yeah, doesn't know awesome. the words to my song. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That can Another detach and go to the surface. I like it. Great mobility here. Say a underwater vet lab. Awesome. <laughs> the fish come in for treatment. I love it. And a whole oh. entire city underwater. That's oh. pretty cool. Yeah. Full on Atlantis there. Edward. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Shark Robot cannons. <laughs> love it. Oh, this oh, one has multi -levels. great. Yeah, great design. Full on blueprints. Elevator on the way down. Yeah. Lydia has one. Great work, you guys. Floating lab, yes. Oh, nice work, Ava. I love this one. <laughs> Ezekiel. Good sea life there. I like it. Beware of shark. A mermaid sea lab. Ooh. Nice. And lab in Minecraft. David. Very nice. Periscopes there, yep. The fish is singing the song. And I think the shark's going to be like, I'm going to come get you for singing that song. <laughs> <laughs> Great work, Hannah. Great octopus over here. I love all the sea life. And then several uh -huh. of you guys made your own Jacob's Ladders. So we've got one out of granola bars. I love it. One made out of paper boxes and some Kit Kats and other candy <laughs> bars. Well done. Well done. Very tasty looking. I love, I love seeing the creativity and um and the art art skills it, when we when we look at these showcases they're super fun now so, we have um 
we have another exciting day planned tomorrow, but tomorrow we're going to shift gears a little bit. And instead of doing geology, we're going to talk about ecology because it's Earth Day tomorrow. And I wanted to tell you, in case you weren't aware, there is a meteor shower tonight and tomorrow night. It's called the Lyrids, and it's the first meteor shower of the year. And what what's happening is the Earth is passing through the tail of an ancient comet that went through. And that comet, when it was traveling through our solar system, it left all these particles of dust and these bits of rock and debris. And as we pass through, we see shooting stars. They're small enough that they just burn up in the outer upper layer of the atmosphere. And this one is not, it's not super, super active. If you lay out at, at, at nighttime and look for shooting stars, if the skies are clear, you should see a couple an hour. And so it's, a, it's an exercise in patience. You lay down and you just you don't know. Are you gonna see a whole bunch right away? Are you gonna see just one or two? It's different every year. And there's always the chance that it could be a super burst. That's not really likely, but every now and then when we pass through these regular meteor showers, we happen to pass through a little cluster and there are tons of them. And so fingers crossed that the clouds go away. Yes, and everyone tell Math Dad, if the weather is good, that we should definitely go and, and do some stargazing tonight, right Math Dad? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> should take us out to the desert. I will. We live near Las Vegas, and so for us to see stars, we have to drive like an hour, an hour away at least. And so whenever I have these ideas about like, oh, let's go see the meteor shower, usually Math Dad and the other people in our family are sort of like, yeah, hmm. don't give her ideas. She, she, she doesn't need any more ideas. But, <laughs> but yeah, thank you for joining us today, and we're, we're, we'll be excited to see you tomorrow to talk about ecology. And, and what's our math topic for tomorrow? Um, that's a really good question. We're going to be visualizing data some more. Um, so I, and talking about averages, right? Oh, that's right. So measuring the centers. and So yeah, we're talking about means, medians, and modes. We'll see you tomorrow, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.